Hi, my name is Mark Armini. Today I'm going to be talking about literature in general and a very particular author specifically, namely Gene Wolfe, who happens to be my favorite author and I believe a subject of some misprision or misreading. Um, his critical neglect in the literary community has been something that's concerned me probably for the last 15 or 16 years. So I wanted to talk about some of the possible reasons for this relative neglect despite his commercial and relatively well-known reputation in the science fiction community. In 2013, he was selected as science fiction grandmaster, kind of a culmination of a lifelong project of creation. And I think it's very important that his name be recognized not only in that particular genre and community, but kind of throughout literary history. Um, one of the things that I think is most important in discussing literature in general is the real reason why we bother to read at all. The concept of literature was very different than it is today. Aristotle, when he wrote his Poetics, was trying to classify not only comedy and tragedy, but also things that were scientific in nature. He was trying to classify animal systems, the kingdoms and phyla. Very soon I'm going to talk about particular details that may spoil some of these books. So if you haven't read them, I'm just going to recommend a few texts and then we'll go from there. Uh, one of the first easiest, most accessible places to get a pretty good idea of the range of his work is The Best of Gene Wolfe. This is kind of a late in his career collection that includes many of his best works from specific collections such as The Island of Dr. Death and Other Stories and Other Stories and Endangered Species, which are also excellent collections. As far as novels go, or series of books, there are three that I consider vital to his oeuvre. Um, the first one is going to be The Fifth Head of Cerberus, which is just a wonderful collection of three novellas that everyone really should take a look at for its treatment of colonialism, individuality, and identity. A very fascinating work that we'll talk about more specifically later. Another is Peace, which also dwells on identity and the nature of memory, and is perhaps a bit more realistic and easier for mainstream readers to get into than the more science fiction-y fifth head of Cerberus. The final recommendation, of course, is the series for which he's most well remembered, The Book of the New Sun. Uh, this series kind of speaks for itself. However, I did want to say, all of these books, you will appreciate much more the second or third time that you take a look at them. And we're going to talk about the reasons why in a few minutes. I would like to go into some critical approaches that I think are useful for understanding and appreciating Gene Wolfe. Uh, he is very firmly in the camp which I would like to call high modernism. And modernism is a very particular philosophical and literary movement that looks at the 20th century as a whole and sees how many things are changing from the 19th century, where you have the breakdown of religious certainty, you have the breakdown of institutions such as marriage, all these things that seem so certain are kind of lost in the horror of industrialization and this power of man to suddenly perhaps destroy everything of value. World War I and World War II showed the world a destructive force that had never before been seen. And I think it's important to place Gene Wolfe in this era of writers who are affected by these rapid changes where they still appreciate the old way of doing things and suddenly this, this new idea, this new creation of technology comes. But Gene Wolfe's relationship with technology is a little bit different than some of these other authors like James Joyce and William Faulkner and other examples of that modernist literary movement because he was trained as an engineer. And an engineer sees things according to very strict physical principles. There are properties of the world that are kind of universally accepted. Otherwise, buildings would not be stable, rockets could not be built, vehicles wouldn't be fuel efficient. And this underpinning of Wolf's fiction, this certainty in universals, is something that I think is really neglected whenever someone takes a look at his work in general. There are a few other types of literary criticism that are useful in dealing with literary works. Um, as a result of this industrialization, in the universities, 
suddenly departments had to justify budgets for English departments, where other things that had never been conceived of before suddenly started to draw all the funding, science classes, engineering, physics, things like this. In order to maintain the relevance of the humanities, a lot of these instructors had to come up with a way to justify reading. Why should we read at all? So they came up with the idea that there were universal truths about the human condition that could be kind of shared and understood just by looking at the text itself. When we start to read, um, we all come to the same text, right? We're reading the same words. However, now we tend to think every reader is going to view that text a little bit differently. And there's also a relationship with what came before, the cultures, the text that it refers to, the conditions at the time of its writing, and our own condition now that we're reading it. I wanted to read a very quick introduction to one of Wolf's works that I think summarizes his idea about what literature does. This is an introduction to endangered species. At this point, it is traditional to state dogmatically that every short story must show a beginning, a middle, and an ending. The lash employed by editors and other critics to flog writers. It's true enough that every story should, although it's not much use to know it. Authors, and they are very rare, who commit stories lacking one of the three necessities always believe the missing element present. The truth is that a good story must have much more than that. It must have a voice that's not purposely changed. At least one character, and at least one event to narrate, though in a few of these stories you may have to search carefully to find it. Most important, it must have a reader, which is the requirement most frequently overlooked. The same critics who spend hundreds of pages discussing various peculiarities of the author's supposed nature often devote none to that much more significant person, the reader for whom he wrote. And he goes on to say that he considers himself a storyteller to entertain. And yet, so many of the criticisms of Wolf's style involve the idea that on a first reading he's too difficult. He really doesn't entertain. He doesn't do those particular things. And we need to kind of try to justify this separation between the intent to entertain and the ideal audience. If someone says, he simply doesn't entertain me, there's really nothing that I can say to overcome that particular objection. That's individual taste. Going to a movie theater, everyone has a preferred entertainment that they come to over and over again. Sometimes they seek comfort, sometimes they seek escape. So, this idea of reader response criticism, where the reader creates the meaning, is something that's very popular in the zeitgeist of, the, of this particular era, 1960s, 1970s to now. Um, it's a hallmark of postmodernism, that meaning is created by the observer, and that they're going to bring something different. However, I think that Wolf is actually not very fruitfully viewed in that particular way. There are other things going on that are universal in nature, and reader response criticism tends to say everything is relative, and that one person's reading, right, the ideal reader, is almost as valid as another's. And if we look at the criticism that's been written on, on Wolf by now, this is the majority of it right here. Um, there are perhaps thousands of articles written on figures such as Faulkner and Nabokov and Joyce, and Wolf has been rather critically neglected, and it's a very interesting phenomenon, especially considering his idea that the text should be somewhat open, somewhat like um, Umberto Eco's assertion in his La Strettura Sente in, in, in Italian there, the absent structure. However, I'm going to argue that Wolf is actually a structuralist, who believes in these universal signifiers and that these patterns that he create, almost like an engineer, actually create a structure of meaning that is, for all intents and purposes, repeatable because we, as, as the reader, are not trapped in the same system as his narrators and his unreliable sources are. Whenever someone's discussing something, they have their own subjective slant in many of his stories. We as readers are kind of free from that perspective. So we're going to take a look at a few examples in a minute here. One of the first stories that I want to talk about specifically is included in his collection, Stories from the Old Ho Hold Hotel. It's called Trip Trap. In this story, um, a, a kind of intellectual comes to a planet that's much more barbaric, and he's trying to observe the cultures and the remnants of a lost civilization. And it alternates between his viewpoint and a warrior leader from the culture. And we see how they view each other. And it seems as if this story is exploring subjectivity. However, Trip Trap 
is also a reference to a pretty famous children's story, right? Three Billy Goats Gruff, where the Billy Goats are trying to cross the bridge, and eventually the largest Billy Goat is able to just kind of kick the troll right off the bridge or ram it with its head and, and, and kill it. Uh, in this particular story, we have that replayed, but everything is very subjective. The arrogance of the visitor, who is nonviolent and believes his ways are superior, he also thinks that he culturally can assimilate into this, this strange culture because he's, he's educated and he understands the way these things work. Um, the primitive warrior, supposedly primitive warrior, who he comes to work with over the course of this story constantly shows how incompetent this guy is, right? He undercuts his, his ability to communicate effectively and at the end of it they face this troll under the bridge who believes himself to be the last remnant of a super alien civilization. So they all have their subjective viewpoints. Now this, this troll has the ability to kind of force his perceptions on the warrior who's native to the planet. The, the scholar who hasn't kind of grown up in that biosphere is immune to those efforts. So together, working together, they can actually defeat the troll. They come together and create the third Billy Goat of the story um, through a more objective reality. However, in this story, they kind of enter a spiritual world. And this is something uh, that is very interesting in, in Gene Wolfe, because in a story about subjectivity, the objective reality is actually a spiritual world. When the warrior's sword breaks in that reality, even though they manage to kill this troll, there are no piercing wounds on him. So in the spiritual world, his sword is, is blunted on the end. Um, in the real world, it still has its point, but it can't do the things that it's supposed to do. It can't actually stab the troll. So in this reality, when the two come together, their understanding becomes objective, and it's a spiritual one. So he actually uses all those trappings of subjectivity and postmodernism and relativism to create an almost universal conclusion where there is an objective reality that these two simply can't comprehend. And this is a pattern that's repeated in Wolf's fiction over and over, where the people inside the story are trapped by their subjective understandings, and we are privy to details, facts, references, universal transcendent signifiers, um, to risk, you know, dabbling into social and structuralism and formal criticism. These universal signifiers that have meaning. I'm going to give you a second example. From his Castle of Days, there is a story called The Changeling. In this particular story, the narrator comes home after going AWOL after fighting in the Korean War. Um, when he comes home, he realizes that there's a, a young boy who hasn't changed at all since he lived in the town. He left circa 1945. You can really chronologically place exactly when everything happened. He believed himself to be in the, the fourth grade in 1944, so the year before he left. And this story is confusing because at the very end of the story, you see that the narrator goes to look for his own picture in a school yearbook, uh, the School of the Immaculate Conception. And that young boy who doesn't age is there in his place. And this doesn't seem to make much sense. We suddenly realize that the mystery is not only of the boy who doesn't age, but of our narrator himself. Where is he? Who is he? When you look at outside details, you can actually come to a sound conclusion that describes the manner in which our narrator's own memories are faulty. He believes himself to have been born in about 1934. However, if he is in the military at the time that the Korean War breaks out, he would have only been about 15 years old at that time. Is there a way to account for the missing three years in this? Yes, there is. Um, the father of that boy who doesn't change tells Peter Palmer, the narrator, that the boy appeared when his daughter Maria was still a baby. She's three years older than Pete Palmer, our narrator. When you do a little bit of research, you find that Pete Palmer was a real actor who was born in 1931, the same year as Gene Wolfe was born, who starred in a pretty famous 
uh, movie series. Um, he played Lil Abner, right? Who was a notorious oaf. So the etymology of the word oaf implies someone who was exchanged in a bad bargain, an elf and changeling, somebody switched at birth. So what we see is that our narrator was actually born in 1931 instead of 1934. And when he wrestled with this um, ageless child in 1944, his own memories were affected, so he believes himself to be in the fourth grade, when actuality he was in the seventh grade. And he was the baby who was switched out. The title is The Changeling. These structural details create a universal reading that explains things, whereas there are other readings that justify how they split apart in some kind of um, psychological fragmentation where he didn't want his world to change. He was damaged by the war and he created this ageless being who would always be there in his youth with a family while his was gone. So one reading is clearly superior in explaining why he's not in the yearbook, what actually happened in the story, why it's named the changeling, and there are external details that actually codify and make these a, a preferred reading that explains everything. Next time, we're going to talk more specifically about the fifth head of Cerberus piece in the Book of the New Sun and some of the criticism that's extant in, in uh, Gene Wolfe's studies. Hopefully, you'll be able to join me as we explore these things very specifically. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.